so we're in Lightroom right now, and I'm just going to start a little slideshow. For these kinds of webinars, the, the themed webinars, I like to have a slideshow that goes into um, a little kind of uh, acclimation of uh, the subject matter. And there have been three dominant themes of uh, HDR style webinars that we've done here at On One Software. We did one, I think last week, uh, another series of urban exploration or that kind of grungy uh, photography. Then we've got these architecture uh, style photos, and then we also do nature and landscape. Those are um, the three dominant styles that I find uh, HDR works best with. Um, I don't find that portraits really work very well unless you mask in, you know, you take, you, you, you run an HDR on a scene like this one, say in Italy, and then you mask in your couple if you want to go for that kind of composite look. But the reason why architecture is really important to me is because, you know, it was, you know, when you grow up, if you have kids or if you're a kid right now um, and you have that, you know, I want to be uh, XYZ moment. For me, the very first XYZ, the first thing I ever wanted to be was an architect. I, I didn't know why. Um, I would always, you know, draw my little square with my triangle on top. And uh, I think part of it has to do with being uh, born and raised in, in Brooklyn, New York, in New York City, which is, you know, one of the densest urban uh, areas in our country, in the U.S., and it's just filled with some really amazing architecture. So being surrounded by that, I think, kind of opened my eyes to uh, what builders and designers and the architects kind of sweated and shed blood over what, to, to give us these beautiful cities. Um, it's really kind of the, the skeleton and the structure of our city, where if you've got bones, your buildings are your city's bones. and you have cars and people, that, that's your lifeblood, and they go through, through, it's very arterial, it's very organic. You have people and cars racing through veins and arteries, and it, to me, that really appeals to me, uh, to be able to see what these architects and these designers kind of envisioned, and then what the builders actually created, and if there's a way that I can kind of sum it up, is this is my kind of way to kind of pay uh, homage or kind of pay uh, a memorial to all those people who really worked their lives to build these amazing structures. Uh, I get to kind of take my vision via photography out of their vision via the buildings that we see in front of you know every day in every city uh, on this planet. So a lot of people wonder you know okay fine well why HDR? And to be fair, a lot of times when I do these HDR webinars, I don't necessarily go into, I guess, more of a beginner reason of what HDR is, and I'm going to do that today. Um, I don't want to err on the side of caution this time. I'll, I'll go over and explain why I want to use HDR for these images. Um, there really is a place. There's a time and a place for HDR, and there's a time and a place when you don't need HDR. Um, but given that this is an HDR-centric webinar, and we're going to use uh, various apps in the perfect photo suite, you know, it makes sense to kind of go over and give you kind of a rationale of why I find it so important, why I've based pretty much all of my work on this uh, style, on this technique. Now, if there's one piece of advice that I can give for those of you who are, you know, eagle eyes going out there to your cities um, to shoot buildings or if you're touring around is, um, depending on the city, some cities are more reactionary than others in terms of the security. Um, I know in the northeast where I live, um, you're pretty much guaranteed to be harassed by a security guard. So know your rights. Uh, more importantly than anything else, you have to understand that at least in the U.S., you have to know your rights. Um, if you're on a public way, for the most part a sidewalk or um, on a street that's not obstructing traffic, you have every right to photograph any building in front of you. Um, there's kind of a under understanding that if you're in public, you don't have, uh, you're not entitled to as much privacy as if you were, say, me standing on a sidewalk with a long lens shooting inside of your living room. Well, that's a different story. And I've been on the receiving end of these arguments, and I will never back down. And I want to kind of share that with you guys too. Is um, these buildings here were built to be admired, not only to be used, but to be admired. If they, if there was just to be used, they would all be rectangle slabs, but you can see all these characteristics and colors and shapes and textures. And they're not there just by accident. They're there for, to, for us to kind of look at and just kind of gaze at and appreciate. 
And I think with photography, that's one of the best ways to, to show that appreciation. So to that point, if I just sum it up, just make sure that know where, where you are in the right, know where you are in the wrong. Um, if you're on private property, you don't have much of a recourse. But if you're on public property, um, you have every right to take pictures of these buildings and just do so courte you know, with courtesy and, and uh, with tact. So I'm going to end this slideshow now, and we'll get into the fun stuff of the presentation. So this is, um, I don't think what, uh, right off the bat, you would think of typical architecture. You know, when I think of architecture, I think of just about anything that's built and man-made, including civil engineering. Now, this is civil engineering. In my opinion, this is very fun civil engineering. I took this uh, in no this past November, just a few months ago. I was out in Seattle, my my very first time, and my buddy Jacob was taking me around, showing me his city. And this is one of the the my most fun things to do is if I have access to walk under these major uh, arterial highways, I try to get there. And Seattle's known for its really kind of wavy roads, or its highways rather. So for HDR, the reason why I would use HDR is because I'm a big fan of trying to capture as much of the original image as I remember seeing it with my own eyes. And with a typical digital camera, you're limited to the amount of information. Uh, that you can capture in a single picture. So by information, I mean you have highlight areas, which are the bright parts of the image. You've got mid-tone areas, and you've got shadows. And your camera can only capture certain, a certain amount of it. And it's going to try to give you, uh, at, at kind of a, a, a summer, summation, it's going to give you the best possible exposure that it thinks it can give you. A lot of times, that's at a loss. You're at a loss of detail in your, your highlights, and you're at a loss of detail in your shadows. To kind of go around that, you can do what's called a high dynamic range photography or bracketing. And you can see here, I've got here in Lightroom, in Lightroom 3.3, and I've got these nine brackets. And what I'm doing is starting from the highlight details, you can see I'm getting detail in my highlights, which there aren't too many of. What I'm more concerned about as I start exposing is I'm getting shadow detail. I'm getting all the detail under this highway here and that to me is important because when I was standing there taking these pictures I didn't see you know this I didn't see like this harsh shadow here I saw all the detail our eyes are absolutely amazing in what we can see and how quickly we could register a really great shift in dynamic range it's as if you were driving in a dark tunnel and then you kind of come out into the uh, broad sunlight you know, it's not like it takes it takes more than you know just a fraction of a fraction of a second for your eyes to adjust and get all that detail. So that's kind of what HDR does. Now, what I would do normally is I'm going to hide Lightroom for a second. I would take those brackets and I would send them into Photomatix, which is what I use for my tone mapping. And what tone mapping is is taking uh, all that information across your brackets and compressing it down to a 16-bit file or a file that you can actually display on your monitor. So to save us some time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this radiance file and usually we get the question of what a radiance file is. A radiance file, it's a, it's a standard file. Um, it's a 32-bit file that you see here. It's kind of pretty ugly at, at face value, but you can take this radiance file and send it into any tone mapping application. So even if you don't use Photomatix, if you use HDRFX Pro by Nick, or if you use um, HDR Express or HDR Exposed by Unified Color, um, they all should be able to uh, read radiance files. And what that means is you can take this 32-bit file here and start tone mapping. Now, in all of my HDR webinars, the first lesson that I like to give, especially to budding photographers, uh, or at least budding HDR photographers, I should say, is start with defaults. Um, you can hit this default button here at the bottom of your menu, and what that'll do is it'll reset all the sliders in Photomatix here to its original settings. And at first, you know, it doesn't look very good, and that's fine. I understand that, but the best way to learn how to use your product is to kind of start at the baseline every single time. Start at square one um, and just keep building from there. So with architecture and with usually with urban exploration photography, I will boost my strength all the way to 100 
Um, with nature or landscape photography, I don't want as much of that effect, so I wouldn't, I'd probably be at around 90% strength with nature or that kind of stuff. Um, in this case here, I'm focusing more on this structure here. The, the trees in the background do a really nice job of juxtaposing uh, what we have of this man-made kind of cold stone slab structure with something a bit more organic. Um, this is pretty kind of monotone and drab. The trees in the background give you kind of some nice color contrast. And we're going to actually exploit that when we stylize, which kind of segues me to my point of tone map. And if, I, I, this is another point I try to make as often as possible in teaching HDR. Do not use photomatics to stylize your image. You can take, you could use photomatics to stylize your image. And what I mean by that is you can take your luminosity and boost it up and your micro contrast and boost it up and drop your overall brightness. And what you're doing here is you're kind of creating your style in photomatics. And I don't recommend that. What I recommend to use photomatics for is to give yourself a nice evenly exposed baseline image. So let's reset everything to default for a second and let's just move our strength. The first thing that I do with uh, photomatics is I'll look at my histogram. I always display my little histogram over here and you can display it too by going to view and then this 8-bit histogram. And what the histogram gives you is this reading from shadows which appear on your left through the midtones and then to the, off to the highlights on the right. If you have any data that's kind of jutted up against the left or the right wall, that means you've got a loss of information. You're actually clipping your highlights or your shadows. To adjust this, after I work on strength in photomatics, I immediately always go to my white and my black points. And that's where I usually kind of make around the same, I'll start off with about plus one stop on both. And you can see now that I drop my white point, we no longer have that blown out area. If I boost it up, you'll see it kind of gets up and you're, you have a loss of information over here. This is kind of the brighter part of the area and this is another brighter part of the area of the image. By addressing this, you're actually kind of working to the point of HDR. The whole point of HDR is you don't want any loss of information. So before you work on tone mapping, you want to make sure that you have good detail, good exposure detail in your shadows and your highlights. So now that we've got that, we can start kind of getting our evenly exposed image. And this right off the bat is pretty good. I'm going to drop my smoothing down to the left. The further left you go on your smoothing slider, the more of that kind of psychedelic and surreal effect you'll get with HDR. Um, and the more the, uh, to the right you go, uh, the more subdued it'll be. The other uh, sliders that I usually pay attention to are luminosity and micro contrast. The luminosity will, will boost the shadow areas just a little bit so you, any area that's a bit dark will get a little bit lighter. Micro contrast will add a little bit of that localized contrast in your shadows so it'll give you a little bit almost like a, a texturized look. Those are really um, the only sliders I'll play around with um, in photomatics. Uh, I know that there are people who like really get up in arms like well why don't you use any of the other sliders I don't need to. Um, usually what I'll, I'll address what these other sliders do uh, in further post-processing. Like, I won't really even touch color saturation. Uh, the overall saturation in this image is pleasing to me. Um, the yellows over here are not too yellow and uh, there's really not much other color so I don't have to worry about um, oversaturating the image. So if I'm done with this image I would hit process but and that would kind of render the tone map. I'm going to close out because to save time I've got that image ready in Lightroom. So here's our one of our mid-range exposures and here is our tone map. So if we just go back and forth you see we don't have any detail in our shadows here and we've got a loss of highlight information in our sky. If we go to the HDR folder now we've got look at that and it's not it's not kinda harsh on the eyes. There's just good detail here. It's almost as if you were standing there uh, looking at this on the overpass. So, and you have detail in the in the sky here. Um, so that's good too. What I want to do next, this is kind of the final thing that I do, and this is where, um, in my opinion, the fun part of photography comes in. Um, this is almost almost like my image zero. This is my baseline. I'm going to send the image to Photoshop, 
so that we can actually work on it in the perfect photo suite. And you can access our products. You don't have to use Photoshop. A lot of our products are accessible right within Lightroom. Um, and some of them are actually standalone, meaning you don't even need to launch Photoshop to begin with. Uh, so we, we're big fans of working where you work here at On One. We don't want to have to tell you, you have to use this product or you have to use that product. If you use a particular product to uh, manage your image library, we want to be there with you. So to access any one of our products here, we've got, there are two easy ways within Photoshop to do that. We've got this On One panel, and if you don't have it, or if you have installed uh, our On One products and you don't see it in Photoshop, you can get to it by going to Window, Extensions, and then just select this little on one item. You can also get to our applications by going to File, Automate, and then you've got these, all of the applications that you've installed will be listed right over here. So I'm gonna go into Photo Tools. Now Photo Tools, for those of you who may not be aware of it, it's a, a collection of over 300 effects that we have that are, if I were to break them down into two categories, the first type of effect that you have is more corrective in nature, and it's more for, I would say, kind of portrait photography, um, where if you want to fix your model's skin or their eyes or, or smooth their hair out or anything, we've got a bunch of those corrective um, effects. For landscape photographers, we also have corrective effects uh, where you see here, you know, you've got this landscape category, and if you want to add a neutral density filter, you can do that, or if you want to boost color, you can do that. And then here's our portrait category, which has all of these portrait filters like um, Magic Eye Fixer or the um, Auto Skin Smoother, which is a, an extremely popular one. But let's go to my favorite category, which are the stylized effects. Um, this is where I live pretty much the entire time um, when I use photo tools. When I look at an image, when I kind of start processing an image in photo tools, and I can pretty much tell you that 99%, if not 100% of my images, run through photo tools. I, I know it really well and I rely on it and I have no problem saying that, that it's that integral of a product for me. What I do when I look at these images is I attack them separately. I look at the elements of my image and I process accordingly. So, and I think you'll agree with me here, there are two dominant elements in this frame. There is this man-made structure and then we have uh, nature in the background. We've got the foliage. So I want to treat them separately. The first thing that I'm going to do is I want to kind of um, bleach out this area here. I want to give it a little bit more of a stony feel. And to do that, I'm actually going to jump out of stylized effects and go to film and darkroom. And I'm going to apply an effect here called bleach bypass. It's the first one in film and darkroom. And when you want to apply an effect, if you select one, you'll see you'll get a preview uh, in this preview window over here, and you'll get a description of what that effect does. And to add it, you can just hit add to stack. Now when an effect comes in, it comes in between usually 70 and 100%, and you really don't, very often times you do not need to go above usually 30%. So what I'll do is, at 0% you won't have any of the effect, and at 100% you'll have you know way too much of it. So I'll start at zero, and I'll just very slowly um, graduate this fade slider, which is kind of like a strength slider, until I'm happy with where I am. Now. There we go. That's I like how it's affecting this image here or uh, the um, the highway. What I want to do though is I don't want that bleach bypass to affect the trees. So if you're familiar with Photoshop, um, we have masking abilities right within Photo Tools. Meaning, if you were to think of these two effects here as layers, this is your uh, background layer and this is the your new layer this masking pen will actually mask through and reveal what was on the underlying layer. So I'm essentially painting out the effect just by drawing on it. And I'm restoring the original color of that foliage, which is what I want. And I'm going to actually accentuate it in a minute. And you can see, if you want to see where you've drawn on your image, you can just click on this show mask button here. And you can see if you missed something. So I'm going to go back and I'll go back to my mask and I can see I've got this pocket here that I missed in the corner. So I can just draw through and close that up to make sure that I'm consistent with uh, what I'm hiding and what I'm revealing. Next up, like I just said, I want to kind of embellish or accentuate the look of the foliage. 
the more you use photo tools, the more you will become uh, familiar with the effects and what each effect does. Now I know that if uh, my image has either a particular element or a particular color, um, I know what effects I can apply to accentuate them. So when you've got foliage or you've got a lot of yellows and greens, there's an awesome effect called pastel colors that I'm going to apply and it just boosts that. Now check this out. I'm going to go back and forth and if you notice it's really only affecting the trees. Look at the highway. It's not touching the highway. The only part of the highway that it's touching is this area over here because it's got a little bit of this kind of moss or lichen that's growing over. So the effect is very, very smart. It's only adjusting certain colors. And so at 0%, the, the trees are a bit muted. So what I can do is I can boost it until I'm happy with uh, the overall color. And I'm happy with the color about 42%. You know, the yellows and the greens are really starting to pop a little bit. And what it's doing is it's giving you a nice color contrast in the image. Um, it's, you know that there are trees in the background and it's giving a little bit of warmth to what would be probably a bit too cold of an image. To that point, I do want to cool off this area here. Um, it's a bit too drab for me and I want I think adding a cool tone will further accentuate the contrast of the warm the warmth in the background and the, the cooling tone of this uh, stone structure. My favorite effect to cool off an image is called cyberpunk and it's also under the stylized effects category. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit add to stack and it'll apply to the entire image. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust the strength slider uh, to the point of which I'm happy. I'm not even paying attention to the trees over here in the background. I'm just looking at the, um, the highway system. I'm getting it to a point where I'm happy with it. Now, if I were to just leave this alone, I would basically undo that nice warming uh, effect that I just applied onto the trees. That defeats the purpose. And that's kind of a, a lesson I really want to drive home with everyone is when you process or when you stylize, stylize with intent. And what I mean by that is I know that I want to cool off this area here, but I don't want to affect the trees. Instead of just painting out all the trees, what I can do is I can hit this invert mask button and it's going to undo the entire effect. I'm then going to change from paint out, which is to the left of invert mask. I'm going to click it to say paint in and it'll do exactly that. What it's going to allow me to do is just paint in the cyberpunk effect at the strength that we've uh, selected and I'm just going to draw it on the structure. And what it's allowing me to do is kind of really, really fine tune the look of my image. Like this is exactly how I want it to look. The HDR gives me the, the um, exposure detail that I remember and then Photo Tools allows me to kind of infuse imagination um, and kind of give it a little bit more of a dramatic feel depending on the, the subject in terms of architecture. Um, I might be uh, give myself more uh, leeway or liberties with stylization. If it's a commercial architecture project, if I'm shooting for um, say a building owner, a hotel owner, or a restaurant owner, I will be a lot more conservative and we're actually going to have, um, I'm building out a new series for that, specifically um, commercial photography and HDR and using our products to kind of fine tune the look. But this is for myself, this is more fine art. Um, and so I can be a little bit more flexible with what I'm doing here. Now, before I ever, whenever I mask, before I finish up, I'll always show the mask because I'm the world's sloppiest drawer and I know that I've missed some areas. And so by showing the mask, I, I can see uh, areas that I've missed and I can ensure consistency, that there isn't like a splotch missing of the cool tone. So here is our before. And I'm doing that by toggling this preview button at the bottom. And here is our after. Not a crazy difference, but um, it's subtle enough where it's noticeable. So I'm going to hit cancel just because we don't need to render it. I've, I've already rendered it in advance for you guys. So here is our mid-range. Here's our tone mapped image. And then here's our stylized image with photo tools.
and it's just a nice, in my opinion, it's a, it's a nice, tasteful, fun shot. Um, I love the way you've got these leading lines that start at the bottom of the frame, go through, they intersect through the frame, and then cut back to the top right corner. I'm a huge, huge fan of terminating lines in a particular corner if you can. I always try to achieve that. Um, to me, that's just very visually pleasing. So let's go on to this next image here. This is, we're still in Seattle. That's the famous Seattle Space Needle. And you can see without HDR, you have to basically choose um, what your exposure uh, is going to be. So you can either expose for the sky and then get a good detail in the, um, in the Space Needle and the tree, or you can choose, this is basically, I believe these are two kind of like monorail tracks, and instead of getting just a standard kind of, you know, your standard tourist shot of the Space Needle, I was trying to think of a unique way to kind of get it. And the more I looked at the Space Needle, the more I realized that really this upper saucer area here and the four little, uh, the, the support beams under it, that is the um, signature of the Space Needle. So I, I'm like, that's what I want to focus on getting. And I found that I can actually get under the monorail track and shoot. So with HDR, what we're going to do is we're going to bracket and expose for the entire range of the scene. So this is the mid-range. Now we're exposing for highlights. So it gets really dark, but we're getting sky and cloud information. The point that I want to make here as we scroll through the brackets is pay attention, pay attention to these clouds here. You should see that they're moving. Movement in HDR, so as you're exposing your brackets, anything that moves in HDR is not really very good. But before I make, finish that point up, I want to show you. So we finished exposing for our highlights and our shadows, or our midtones. Now we're exposing for our shadows. You can actually see, if you go to the very first image, you, ha you would have no idea what this was. But if you go to the shadow exposures, all of a sudden you see, oh, well, it's the underside of something, and you've got these kind of, they look like some sort of catenary wire. So with HDR, we can take all of that detail and fuse it into a single exposure. What I want to do, though, is something very different. We haven't done this yet in an HDR webinar, and it's back to the point of moving uh, elements. So in this case here, we have moving clouds. I can tell you right off the bat, if you were to just go through send these and send these brackets into Photomatix, you would have a degraded image because Photomatix would actually show you the trail of clouds and it clouds um, in a repeating pattern do not look good. Something about a repeating pattern in a cloud a cloud shape registers with the brain as artificial or this is not right. If it was uh, if the clouds were wispier or if they were moving even faster and didn't have defined edges, you might get away with it. And I've definitely gotten away with that. But when you've got these hard edges here, um, you want to be cognizant. You also want to be cognizant of trees. Um, it, clearly, it's a windy day because of how fast the clouds are moving, which also means that these uh, tree branches are moving as well. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to go into the brackets folder here, and we're going to send the brackets to Photomatix. Normally, I would just access the radiance file. But I'm going to send them into Photomatix, and the reason why I want to do that is I want to show you how to use um, the uh, ghost reduction utility with Photomatix 4. We get I've gotten that question a lot, and so I figured you know what, let's spend a little bit of time just doing that. If it'll help you get a better HDR image that you can send into Photo Tools, then it's worth it. So what I'm doing is I just sent the images to Photomatix and. I'm going to select this option here, Reduce Ghosting Artifacts, and I'm going to select the first radio button, Semi-Manual, and I'll hit Pre-Process. So this is going to take, you know, maybe 30 seconds or so. Um, what it's doing is it's taking these nine brackets that I have here, and it's comparing them. Before it'll actually do the tone mapping, though, what it'll, it'll give me the opportunity to select any areas in the image that I know have movement, and then I can choose from any one of these brackets here the information, the exposure information that I wanted to sample from. So what's happening now is it's just reducing noise on each of the brackets. I should have actually turned that off, but no big deal. Uh, Nathan, is there? Um, do you see any questions while we, to kill time? 
You know, we're getting a lot of questions about the uh, HDR software that you're using, and people wanted to know what your experience was with the new CS5 HDR. Uh, mm -hmm. so maybe you want to talk a second about Photomatics as well. Yep. So um, CS, uh, you know, with uh, Photoshop CS5 coming out earlier in 2010, they really kind of Adobe address. They saw that HDR was not just a fad; that it was actually, you know, really around to stay and so they did beef up their HDR tone mapping tools they were the first ones actually to come up with this this kind of ghost reduction utility this selective ghost reduction utility um, personally I'm not I've never been a fan of Adobe's HDR Pro I think is what they call it um, it doesn't I'm not happy with the slider control so you saw all the sliders that Photomatics gives you um, Photoshop's is I'm just not as happy with the uh, product. Um, Photomatics I've been using forever um, and it's gotten consistently better. I have um, I've been on the, the, beta, the beta team for Nix HDR Effects Pro for a long time and they've, they're doing an awesome job and I can recommend HDR Effects Pro especially if you're looking more for uh, the ability to apply presets. So a preset would be if you were to take the sliders that I adjusted and just kind of take a snapshot of them. Nick has done a really nice job of kind of creating a good library of, of presets and they also have their viewpoint technology which allows you to kind of selectively edit portions of your image. Still, I've spent a lot, if I had to compare two products closely, most closely together, it would be uh, HDRFX Pro and Photomatics and I just find the results of Photomatics to be more um, favorable to my eye. Um, that being said, HDR FX Pro is a very popular app, and so is uh, HDR Express, which is um, a really nice intro level uh, tone mapping application by Unified Color. So you've got options, I guess, is the bottom line, and every single vendor out there gives you at least, I think, a 15 or 30 day trial. So go out and just you know try it out. Try try out the ones that you like, um, and then and just pick up the one that works best for you. So that's that's my little rant on tone mapping software. What I want to do is show you. So we've got this image here. Nothing has been tone mapped yet. What we're doing is I'm going to uh, actually I'm going to boost the zoom up. And if you see here, do you see all the, the the kind of repeating pattern here? This is garbage. This is not good HDR. And if you want to take yourself seriously as an HDR photographer per se, or if you want to do a lot of HDR. Um, you really want to pay attention to this because this is what separates someone who's more seasoned to someone who's just starting out is is addressing this stuff. It's not fun. I don't want to have to deal with this, but you know it's worth it for the few extra minutes. The way you can remove the ghosting in Photomatics is I'm going to start drawing the area that I want to kind of reduce the ghosting in. Now I had about two cups of very strong coffee so I'm trying to be straight and if you notice I'm not just selecting the clouds I'm selecting the entire swatch of sky the trees and the um, space needle and if I was doing this for a production I would be a lot more careful but this caffeine is really really hitting me okay so we've drawn through this swatch over here I'm gonna right click in the swatch, not outside, but inside, and select this mark selection as ghosted area. It'll uh, turn the broken line into a solid line. And now what we can do is we can hit this preview deghosting. And what it, Photomatics does is, it, is it, it'll sample at random one of the brackets that you send in. So if you hit this return to selection mode and right click in your selection, and then go to the bottom to the set another photo for selection you'll see the nine exposures we sent in and it's roughly one two three four stop intervals up and down it it shows the zero exposure <clears throat> now I was actually pretty happy with this selection over here but just to kind of for for uh, due diligence what I usually do is I'll select the image uh, that's one stop darker take a look and then I'll go back and select the image that's one stop lighter and take a look just to kind of compare and in this situation here Photomatics did a good job by calling the zero exposure I think that that is the best one 
what this is doing essentially is if you notice the clouds are nice and sharp here and uh, the trees are snapped it, it will really really do wonders for your HDR tone mapping if you um, kind of address that the same thing goes for people if you have kind of a, an area a uniform area in your scene where you have a flow of people one of those exposure exposures should have good detail um, for your people even if they're still in motion there's a difference between um, natural motion and artificial motion and natural motion is more like a per if it's a, a little bit of a longer shutter speed and the person is kind of blurred that's acceptable your brain kind of in, in, in the realm of photography your brain should say okay I get this but when you see two or three copies of your, the person right next to each other that's artificial that screams bad HDR and you can address that with a t utility like this and yeah Photoshop definitely has that the other apps like um, HDR Express and HDR FX Pro ha they have ghost reduction built in but it's automated you don't have the ability to specify the area that you want to address and so it's really a crapshoot. You have to you you want to assume that it's going to do as good of a job. So that is um, the little a little lesson on ghosting. I hope that helps. And what I'm going to do straight is I'm just going to show you. This is the tone mapped image here. Um, just an, I'm, I was just going from more of an evenly exposed image, not much else. And I'm going to send it straight into Photomatics, or rather into Photoshop, and then into Photo Tools for stylization. So again, let's go into Photo Tools. When I have the ability, I try to kind of break the image up into its primary elements. And in this case here, we have two, again, two clear elements. We've got the, the monorail tracks here, and then we've got the swatch of sky. So I want to first work on the monorail. And the monorail to me is a bit too bright, too cheery. Um, I want to kind of make it a little bit more industrial. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to stylized effects and I'm going to select the effect here called Omaha Beach and the reason why I'm going right to these is because again I've used these this application for years I know which effect will give me the desired results so you can see this looks awful but it only looks awful because it's applied globally to the sky here what I'm going to do is I'm going to first adjust the strength and I'm paying attention only to the metal I'm adjusting the strength uh, to where I'm happy and then I'll select the mask brush and with the paint out option selected I'm just going to draw out the sky and what that's doing is it's restoring that nice blue tone and color the clouds are getting a bit too dark so by removing that effect they're, they're kind of looking more natural and it's looking good already um, if we kind of deselect the preview I'm happy with what I'm getting with in the uh, monorail tracks next up I want to adjust um, the sky a little bit and so to do that I want to soften it overall and we have an effect here, here called Orton here's a who it's right below Omaha Beach and it, it replicates uh, Orton processing which is a, a legacy style where you in Photoshop at least you kind of duplicate layers um, and one you will have one layer mask that is somewhat of a radial blur and uh, this gives you a kind of a fuzzy dreamy look so some effects or not some effects but a lot of our effects have these kind of options or sub options and selecting them will give you um, kind of a preview of what each one does so let's say I select Orton here's a who and fresh and clean as the sub option I'm gonna add it to the stack and I I like what it's done to the sky I'm not worried about the track because I'm gonna remove the effect from the track but let's say I want to see what um, the normal option does I can either remove the effect and select the option and re-add it or I can just double click this icon I get this question a lot what does this icon mean any effect that has multiple options will have this icon next to it and if you double click it you'll get a little hot pop-up and I can select normal and then hit apply and the reason why I want to hit apply with normal is the difference between normal and fresh and clean is primarily the amount of uh, color saturation boost that the effect will give normally I don't like a boost in color saturation but in this case here I think it works really well because it does a nice job of softening and boosting the color of the blue and the color of the foliage as well as the kind of yellow sunshine on the uh, Space Needle 
So I'm going to adjust the strength. I usually just drop it down to zero and I boost it up slowly and I'm only paying attention to the sky. That's good. I like that over here. And then what I'm going to do is with my masking brush, I'm going to paint out and just remove the effect from the, the, the tracks here. And not only now am I contrasting um, color, but when we're done with this, we'll also, we'll also contrast with texture. Um, I want I like kind of giving people different ways to um, get their images to stand out, and contrast is a wonderful way. Um, normally, contrast is the you know the difference between brightness and darkness, but there are other ways. Specifically, you can contrast with tones, with warm tones and with cool tones, and especially with HDR, one of my favorite ways to contrast is with texture, where you have smooth textures or lack of texture, and then more rough textures. And you can see here, if you look um, on the bottom here, you've got texture, you've got these kind of streaks over here that we want to embellish. Okay, so the last thing that I want to do to kind of get that texture is, you can do it several ways. Within Photo Tools 2.6, under the Basic Brushes category, we've got this Brush More Dynamic Range. Now, this will basically boost texture, but I warn you, it you want to apply it in very, very small doses. You'll notice that next to the effect, there's a paintbrush icon here. What that means is, if you remember with every other effect that we've applied, it applies it to the scene. If it, you've got a paintbrush effect, that means it's a paint in effect. Nothing will happen until you start painting it in. And so right away we can start drawing, I'm just drawing on the um, monorail track again. And what it's doing is it's adding nice, some nice texture. It's popping that area really, really nicely. And then once I'm done, I'm, I really don't, don't want a lot of it. I just want the tiniest bit. About 10 or 11%. And so if we start and we deselect our preview, again, with these types of uh, photos, I'm not looking for a dramatic change. I'm just looking to kind of fine tune everything and to punch areas that need punching. I'm going to hit cancel, and then we're going to go back to Lightroom so we can see what we've done. So here is our mid range. Again, you can't tell what it is. Here's our tone mapped image, and then here is our uh, stylized image. The last thing that I want to do is, and this is just, think of this as uh, an optional last step. If I really, really want to draw your attention to the, the uh, Space Needle, I can send the image back to Photoshop. And instead of using Photo Tools, we can use uh, our product called Focal Point, which allows you to kind of select where you want the focus of your image to be. It's kind of like, you know, if you had a, a lens baby lens or a really, really fast lens uh, or a tilt shift lens. It's like having that in your, uh, in your lens arsenal. So I'm going to launch Focal Point. And let's just right off the bat reset the image here. And the way Focal Point works is you've got this focus bug, this little critter guy here, and you can adjust its shape and its size by tugging at its legs. It also has antennas which adjust the blur amount and the feathering and the vignetting. Well, I know that this is not a round shape, this swatch over here. It's more planar. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the shape from round to planar. You'll notice that the bug, the body changed from round to a square. And you'll notice that it's no longer a round mask. It's more of a rectangular mask. And so what I'm going to do is just place it kind of over the swatch of sky here. And then I'm going to adjust the feathering. Now the feathering is the amount of transition from your in focus to your out of focus regions. Um, so if you have zero feather, it'll be a hard line. Literally, you know, one pixel will be out of focus and then the next pixel will be in focus. And it's, it's not ve very visually uh, appealing. The next thing that I'll do is I'll adjust the blur amount. So I did the feathering over here and now I'm going to do the amount and I'm just going to drop it. I don't want that much of a blur. Okay, I'm also going to boost the optical quality, which will kind of restore a tiny bit of texture in the areas that are out of focus. And then I can also drop the brightness of the areas that are out of focus to help draw the eye towards the center of the frame. 
I can boost the contrast. So here's our original image, and it's not bad, but here's our uh, image with the tracks out of focus. Now, I'm looking at my recorder machine, and I can see that obviously we're broadcasting over the internet, so there is some compression. Rest assured that this looks a lot better when it's on your monitor. Like when I'm looking at it over here, you don't see, I can see here there's compression over here and over here. It's not there on my screen, so I don't want you to worry about that. So it's just another way that you can kind of fine tune your image and control exactly where the eye goes. Um, so here's our, um, that was our uh, stylized image in photo tools, and then this is our focal point image. Okay, let's move on here to our next image. So architecture doesn't always have to be very boring. Um, it can actually be, you can actually have a lot of fun with it, especially if you've got really funky ultra wide angle lenses. Um, and so in this case here, I, I had a, a I had just picked up uh, my uh, a 14 millimeter prime lens by Canon, um, and I wanted to see what it can do. Now I'm a for those of you that may know me, I'm a huge fan of tilt shift lenses. I use tilt shift lenses every day to get kind of correct images for architecture. Um, so when I'm using my 14 millimeter lens, I'm usually kind of going out with the mindset that I want to embrace distortion. So here, this is an image in um, Boston. I mean, that's this is Boston right over here, and I'm in the Christian Science Center Plaza, or Christian Science Monitor Plaza, I think it's called. And I wanted to have a little fun, and I, I realized that if I stood under this uh, building over here, which has this kind of stone awning, if you will, jutting out, and I tilt my lens upward, it almost looks like you've got this UFO approaching the city over here. And it's cool because you have very, very distinct styles of architecture contrasting each other. Um, this is the Christian Science Center Museum, I believe, and this is the Prudential Tower. Um, and this is, a, I think, the Sheridan Hotel. So you've got these different buildings, and it's, it's actually pretty fun. I'm, I was really enjoying uh, what I was seeing. So I bracketed so that I can ensure that I get detail in the shadow area here, in the darkest parts, as well as information in the highlights. So I've got good sky exposure. What we're going to do is we're going to go back here and we'll take the radiance file and drag it onto photomatic so you can see what we'll do uh, to get the evenly exposed image. Um, and that's something that I kind of, the point that I, I like to make here is um, with architecture it doesn't always have to be very stuffy per se. It, you can actually have a lot of fun uh, with this stuff. I'm just going to fit the image to the screen and close the preset here and reveal my toolbar. So let's hit default. And this is a good example of where I wouldn't necessarily need to do a ghost reduction because you, this is what I was talking about in terms of clouds that are much, much wispier. Um, the movement is not as, uh, it's not as exaggerated. It's a little bit creamier and that I can get away with. But if it was a harder edge cloud, I would probably have drawn through this entire area here and um, reduced the ghosting. So let's boost the strength up. And again, like I said, I can see right off the bat, I've got a tiny bit of highlight clipping because it's jutted up on the right. And that's because for some reason, I don't know why HDR soft feels that it's necessary to have your white point boosted out and your black point non-existent. But we, we'll just address that really quickly. And you can see with those two quick tugs, we've got good kind of shadow and highlight information. I'm actually going to drop the shadow just a little bit. The next thing that I'll do is I'll adjust my overall brightness, which is this gamma slider here. And I'll just get it kind of to a point where I'm happy. Um, when you're processing in your tone mapping application, one of the things that I like to recommend is, if anything, process towards the brighter side of the image than darker. So, you know, if I drop the brightness here, it actually looks pretty cool. It looks somewhat moody. But when you send it into photo tools, if you noticed, Photo Tools does do a, a pretty good job of kind of darkening the image. So by starting off with a brighter baseline, you're giving yourself maneuverability. You're giving yourself room to process. And it'll make the image a little bit cleaner because you're not going to have a great loss in shadow area. Next thing I'm going to do is adjust my smoothing. So I've, I've adjusted the strength, my white and black point, and my overall brightness. 
After that, I'm going to drop my smoothing. I never really go past negative two on my smoothing. If I go all the way to the left, it kind of it gets way too psychedelic for me. Um, and if I go to the right, it's too muted. So about usually between uh, negative one and negative two, uh, and it's kind of blending your the light, the highlights, the shadows, and the midtones together to give you this evenly exposed image. Next up. I don't have too much in terms of shadows that I want to brighten, maybe over here, so I'm not going to add much luminosity. And I'm not going to boost the micro contrast too much, that's even too much, I'm going to drop that a little bit. And so when I'm happy here, I'll hit process and we'll, we would render it back into Lightroom. But as you know, I've got it ready for you guys. And just out of full disclosure, the only thing that I did was I brought the image into Photoshop. Um, and I ran a noise reduction filter on the sky because uh, it was super noisy. Uh, and that's typically something you'll find even, I shoot with a 5D Mark II camera, which does an amazing job of noise reduction, uh, at even especially at its low ISO settings, which most of these are at ISO 100. Um, you still get noise. You're compounding these, these images on top of each other, and so noise gets compounded. Uh, and the other thing that I did was, if you notice, uh, if we go back to this, this let's go to a mid-range over here. Uh, I, I cloned out this area on the right, these little buildings. I didn't want them there. So uh, let's send the image to Photo Tools. And as this is happening, you know, as I'm process, processing the image, I'm starting to think about what I want to do. You know, what's the point of this image? And like I said, I was. this is an image where I wanted to try to have some fun. I wanted to kind of, you know, I don't know, be kind of whimsical. And I'm thinking, especially because of the way these buildings are kind of leaning back, it, it looks like one of those really cheesy horror pictures, except instead of people kind of running away, it's almost like buildings are running away uh, at the approach of this mothership here. So, elements. What are the elements of our image? Well, primarily we've got our little UFO, we've got our city that's under siege, and we've got our sky. So let's process accordingly. And the first thing that we'll do is we'll start with the UFO. So the, what I wanted to do first when I was thinking about it was I wanted to give it more of a sinister look. And we have this under the stylized effects category, this effect, the first one called 30s Noir. Now, again, it's going to apply globally. And really, um, if you were going for an ultra high key black and white image, this is pretty cool. You can just leave this as is. and. Um, especially because you've got this hard shadow and this harsh highlight separation, it works. But that's not, I don't want to give you kind of like a one trick uh, pony here. I want to show you how you can stack effects to get a pretty cool image. So I'm going to drop the strength and I'm really only, again, I'm looking at the UFO. I'm not looking at the rest of the city. And I'm getting to a point of where I'm happy. And when I'm happy with what I see here, I'm going to invert my mask. So we've removed the entire effect. And with our masking brush, with, which is this little uh, paint icon, the paintbrush at the bottom, I'm going to select paint in. By default, it'll be paint out. But we don't want to paint anything out because there's nothing there. Instead, we're going to restore the effect by painting it in. And I'm just being quick right now because of time. But I want to make sure that I kind of get to the edges as close as I can. And let's say like you go like, whoa, you know, I really messed up over there. Uh, you can either undo or you can change the mode back to paint out and just draw out that area. So that's, um, that's uh, the difference between painting out and painting in. Okay, so we've got, we're starting to get a good foundation of our UFO, but the last thing that I want to do to it is I want to cool off the tones over here. It's a still, the tone in this structure still matches the tone over here a little bit, and like I said, it's all about contrasting. It's giving your viewer's eyes room to play, and right now there's not much going on here if you're thinking about color and tone. It's just blue and this kind of warmer, yellowy color. So cyberpunk is what I used earlier. I'm going to use it again. And we're going to do the exact same thing. I'm going to adjust the strength uh, to where I'm happy. I'm only paying attention to the UFO. Then I'm going to invert the mask, select paint in, and just like we did before, just quickly paint in. And what it's doing is it's giving it a little bit more of this kind of gray-blue uh, 
feel to it. It's definitely cooler. And you can show your mask to see if you've missed any. And we didn't miss anything, so we're good there. Now, let's adjust or let's address this area here, our, our city that's being attacked. I want to warm this up. We, we, it should be no surprise. This is warmer and darker. This will be or cooler and darker. This will be warmer and a little bit brighter. There are two popular warming effects in the stylized categories. There's this golden hour enhancer, uh, which I like to use more in nature scenes. And then there's also this autumn effect. And I like the autumn effect in this case here because it's going to add a little bit of a browner, ruddier warmth to the, uh, to the image. When it comes in, it applies to the entire image. And so we're just going to invert the mask. Actually, before I do that, let me go back. And I didn't adjust the strength. The first thing you want to do is before you do any masking, you want to get the strength to where you're happy. And the reason for that is um, you don't want to have to deal with adjusting sliders after you've masked uh, the image. You can. You can mask everything and then adjust the slider afterwards. But per personally, I like to do my strength first, invert the mask, and that way I know when I paint in, there's no other work I need to take care of, at least with this particular effect. I can just paint it in. And I can already start to notice uh, the difference between the warm structures in our foreground in the lower right of the frame and then the cooler structure on the top left of the frame. Now, if, again, you paint, like I painted out over here, I can see a little bit of uh, the effect in the sky. I'm just going to select Paint Out. I'm just going to restore that sky. I'll show the mask to see if I missed anything. And I'm OK here. And then a lot of times what I'll do is I'll deselect the preview and then reselect it. So we're doing good. The last thing that I want to do is just boost the overall color contrast of this image. And to do that, I'm going to use an effect here called Turbo Boost. And I'm going to let this hit the entire image. I don't need to, um, I don't need to mask it out anywhere. I actually like the effect that it has on the overall image, except I don't want 50% of it, you know, at 100%, you can see it gets really, really saturated and, and punchy. I just want maybe about 25%. And so that's really where you'll see a nice difference between the before and the after. Okay, so that's basically it for, in terms of examples that I have here for the session. 